a businessman that all of you, all of you, all of us have heard about, okay? Here's the quote. Technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with humanities, that yields the results that make our hearts sing. Now, this sounds like a very utopian, you know, artsy-fartsy statement. Um, it was made by a guy who uh, very recently, until very recently, was running the richest company in the world. In other words, we are talking about somebody who knew his stuff and made billions, gazillions of dollars doing it. This statement was made by uh, Steve Jobs earlier this year, okay? The CEO of Apple. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Pete. And the second last speaker will be Thomas Wahlgren. And he describes himself as um, an activist philosopher who doesn't really mix disciplines, but who aims to fuse or to conf uh, confuse theory and uh, public action. And he seeks to reimagine the idea of emancipation through enlightenment uh, with philosophical tools derived from Socrates, Wittgenstein, and Kanti. So the floor is yours. So, uh... That's a huge agenda for five and a half minutes. Five, uh, sharp. five sharp. I thought it was five and a half. So if it doesn't go quite right, then you know why. Um, uh, I thought I'd start with, uh, uh, with uh, inviting you to imagine how you were terrified this morning, those who, of you who were here, and I'll give my version. Uh, my my uh, shock this morning had the following contours. First... We have the official doctrine. We have, I mean, Big East from Finnish science policy were here this morning to speak about our topic. And thanks for coming. It was great uh, that these people with their tight shadows took the time. Uh, the, there was the blah, blah about uh, that we all know that humanities is very useful. Uh, so that is the official rhetoric when we come here that we all know we just have to remind people who, make, who take, take decisions about funding that we are useful and then money will come in. But luckily, our bosses are not that naive that they trust that when they do their actual work, they can rely on this message. No, because the world is not rational like that. They just give them the, right tru the, the truth, and then liberation will come to you. It's not that way it works. Uh, so in actual fact, the people who are talking today, when they do their uh, donkey work on, on science policy, what they actually do is they... Uh, they find mechanisms of overcoming the ideological and irrational hurdles to funding for humanities. And that, the recipe there, I mean, so that's fine, I think, to see reality as it is and not stay only with the idealistic uh, rational for finance humanities, that I agree with. Uh, but what I was terrified uh, by was how our leading uh, science policy uh, people suggest that we... Uh, get the money. Uh, I think this main suggestion was that we integrate humanities and social sciences more tightly in a science policy framework in which the overriding concerns are with utility. Uh, that we find our way into those programs, frameworks, consortia, in which the big money is and the big money comes because of utility ex expectations uh, on the short run. And so the expectation is that we should uh, be more part of that. And that's exactly where my sort of research interests lie. The lie in how we could conceptualize today uh, the uh, 2,500 years old dream of, of, of the modern West or the Western of the Occident, uh, that we have this, uh, this positive intrinsic nexus between freedom and truth. Uh, the idea of truth shall make us free. What kind of imagination does it inspire in us? What kind of hopes do we invest in this idea today? What kind of hopes uh, how much and what kind of hopes do we invest in this idea that, that truth shall make us free? And the last 500 years, I mean, have been this, this area of, of amazing cultural energy. Nowhere on the planet during the million years of Homo sapiens have people created as much uh, energy to transform the face of the planet, to, the, the, to intervene in the history of the biosphere, to, to, uh, to make cultures meet, uh, to create uh, commonalities between cultures. No other... Uh, no other cultural force, no other human innovation has been as energetic in transforming 
the practices of people and the lives of other species than the than high modernity, the, the culture that evolved originally in Europe in the past 500 years. And I think it is essential, this is trivial, but I think it is an essential part of the energy of high modernity uh, that we had this very simple idea of how the search for truth transforms into freedom. And, and the, the, the idea was that we have, we have more, more knowledge, uh, the, the, uh, the growth of knowledge is, uh, is materialized uh, in technology, Technology brings instruments. The instruments bring cap uh, capabilities to use the multi sense terms. Uh, when we have capabilities, we have more freedom for people and everybody's better off. So this is the, and if that is the framework of the past 500 years and the framework of a fantastic success, no wonder that our uh, science policy advice is to let's integrate humanities in the big framework programs. So this is still the dominating imagination of the idea of emancipation through enlightenment. Now, uh, if I can get the second, uh, can, you, can I do this myself? Yes, I could. Uh, <laughs> very proud of uh, this uh, philosopher, very lazy with uh, technology, but I managed. Uh, so uh, there's a change in, in self-confidence, and, and the early visionaries of, of the uh, 20th century, people like Wittgenstein and Gandhi, were, they were not the first, but they're prominent among those who saw uh, the crisis of modernity as a crisis of cultural self-confidence, that there's something which is not attractive any longer in this idea of progress through enlightenment that, ha that made high modernity possible. A, the energy is still there. Uh, Arnold Galen once wrote, the Aufklärung is taught, but the consequential laufen weiter. Uh, so enlightenment is dead, but the, the effects uh, keep evolving. So we see the evolution, the effects, the, the trust in the energy released by high modernity uh, shapes our practices. But in our hearts, we're no longer there. We don't have the confidence, we don't have the... So in this, I'm searching for alternative conceptual instruments by looking at Socrates, Wittgenstein and Gandhi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Truly thought-provoking. And our last speaker, but definitely not least, is Sirpa Brere. And she describes her academic personal field as sociology.